trail and ultra runners what is going on what's happening welcome to another episode of the coop cast as always i'm your humble host coach jason coop and this episode of the coop cast is a special one because i am coming to you live from the adventure van i'm out on the road right now but i still record podcasts on the road hope you guys enjoy it this podcast is with none other than simon marshall who's a sports psychologist and i had his wife leslie patterson on on the coop cast just a few weeks ago we had an incredibly hilarious and really honestly practical conversation all about sports psychology I really appreciated talking to Simon. He is one of those very funny yet down to earth and practical practitioners in the space, which all too often get weeded and clutter up with woo woo type practitioners. I think you guys will really enjoy this conversation. I really enjoyed it. And I'm gonna get right out of the way. Here's my conversation with Simon Marshall. I always feel that when I talk to really highly specialized people, especially people who deal with anything with the brain, <laughs> it's it gets really complicated because like the brain is this mysterious organ that we really like we really don't know very well and it's mm-hmm. got a lot of allure to it and you know, half the people that that tune in are really fascinated by the brain. And the other half get tuned out just because it gets so freaking complicated. Overwhelming. Yeah, yeah it's, overwhelming is, is, is a really good word. And so since we're going to spend a little bit of time like talking about some of some like really technical like neurophysiology sure, sure. stuff, let's start with the basics. Like I kind of feel like this is going back to college, like freshman level yeah, anatomy yeah. and physiology for the yeah, brain. Yeah. Let's kind of start with that and then we can then we can dive into how sure. sports performance actually works in the sure, brain. Sure, sure. I mean, and we can keep it, you know, uh, we will keep it very sort of light and hopefully unjargony. Um, I'm going to use I, that, by the way, unjargony. Yeah, yeah. Un- <laughs> if that's not a word, it should be de-jargonized. Uh, um, no, we can we can start. So how do you want to do the, the start? And, uh, let's do it now. You just want to just roll it. Okay. Yep, let's do it now. So, well, one of the one of the I think the most fascinating things about the human brain for me is that over the last probably thirty to fifty years, which might seem a lot in, in terms of science terms, but in terms of what we've known and how we've studied the human brain, it's a very short period of time. And one of the things that we've learned, and this is the caveat to anything that you read about brain training uh, or this new device that you put electrodes on your head and suddenly you can become an NFL player or what, you know, <laughs> I, I don't, don't get me started on some of the, claim, the, the dubious claims. But, but one of the, the, the myths that we've dispelled, well, we've dispelled a number of myths, one of which is that the notion of left people are left-brained, right-brained, and we're using all of our brains the majority of our, the time. So that's one thing. Oh, you're artistic. You must be what right-handed or left-handed. I forget which. The, you know. The, um, so that's one sort of area that's been sort of frustrates certainly neuroscientists. And the other is that we've conflated structure with function. So in other words, one of the old beliefs and and both in pseudoscience like phrenology. Remember the the, the bus of the head and yeah, this yeah. part of your head is this. And but even in a scientific terms that has more science behind it, the notion that there are particular locate physical coordinates in your head that are responsible for job A, B, and C, and we know that that's not true either. Most parts of our mm-hmm. brain have this wonderful sort of symbiotic relationship with other parts. And so the brain is really best thought of as, yes, it's uh, an organ. And in, in, in my famous uh, favorite Woody Allen quote, it's my second favorite organ for most people <laughs> in my brain, um, is that it's, it's a series of networks and algorithms. That's really the best way to describe it. So all of the things that even our, the, what we think of as our mind, these sort of abstract thoughts and feelings that kind of swirl, they don't feel necessarily physical, but they're sort of in our some abstract space in our heads. They're all properties, emergent properties of, of brain and central nervous system physiology. So bre- neuroscientists don't really separate mind and body. Mind is part of the body. It's just that one is an emergent property of the other and it's very hard to sort of measure it uh when it comes to things like abstract ideas or concepts so function and structure uh get confused a lot and we are guilty of doing this as well and we point this out in our book is that whenever you hear 
that an author or um, some scientists are trying to use a metaphor to explain what the brain does and how it plays tricks on us. They'll often talk about structure, like, oh, there's the prefrontal cortex that does that or the limbic system that right, does that, that we right. do. But in actual fact, the small print is a far more complicated than that. So that's the sort of the, the little caveat to the, you know, <laughs> the, the simplistic <laughs> metaphor that mo many of us use. <laughs> But it's prevalent though, right? I mean, you, like you said, everybody tries to use these different metaphors for different areas of the brain. When we talk about sports performance though, what, what are the key ones that we're gonna focus in on? Yeah, so the parts, and, and the nice thing is that uh, your brain doesn't care whether you're in a sport environment or not. It just knows that you're in an environment that probably at some level poses some threat to you. It could be a physical threat, because uh, I don't want to hurt for nine hours uh, in the mountains. Uh, it could be a purely a psychological threat that you're worried about being last or being left behind or not being strong enough relative to other people. So your brain's mechanisms for figuring out what is threatening are really quite primordial and, and unsophisticated. They don't, they can't separate nuanced of like, well, it's a it's a C race versus an A race. No, your your brain is like, listen, listen, dude, human, am I going to get eaten or not? Okay, we're good. Is there an opportunity to shag or not? Okay, no. Okay, we're good. So what's left over? So what's left over is I don't want to feel humiliated, embarrassed, or shown to be inadequate in front of other people. Those three things: humiliation, embarrassment, and inadequacy. And the and Mother Nature has actually given the human brain. Uh, like mechanisms to kick and scream against the likelihood of those situations, anticipating those situations happening. And, and millennia ago, that would have meant death because you're ostracized from your troop and you have to fend for yourself, both in security and foraging for food. And so you probably would die if you, if you did get ostracized. But now, you know, the, we, we, you, you aren't. And so, but your brain, of course, doesn't know that. And so all of that, those sort of feelings and thoughts we don't want, come from a fairly, no uh, coincidence, a, a fairly reptilian primordial place in our heads as well, right in the center. Your, the human brain is just like a tree. If you cut it uh, in, in a sort of a lateral plane and you count the rings on a tree to how old it is, the, the, the parts in the middle are the oldest parts of our brain. And so the newest parts are the wrinkly stuff on the outside. Um, and so the, the, the structure and function of the deep parts of our brain, the limbic system is one of those, carry quite prehistoric survival mechanisms for when we were literally just, you know, some, some uh, a nervous system and some muscles trying to get food and stop being used as a toy for somebody else. Um, <laughs> so that, unfortunately, that wiring system that we call our chimp brain or your limbic system, about the size of an avocado right in the center where all of our urges, cravings, all of our emotions come from is pretty much on genetic lockdown. There's not much we can do to change how that is. Uh, we can change the parent of it, which is your frontal cortex, what we call your professor brain, uh, so that you don't offend people all the time and just steal everything or hump anything that moves or all the other things that make us good, responsible human you know, citizens. Um, but many people do have a limbic system that is a very highly agitated or very on high alert all the time because of the way the structures, and that makes some people's lives really miserable. So some people do have, if you have chronic anxiety, for example, or had depression structures in your limbic system in that part of your brain are just wired slightly differently and you can make your life experience not just of sport but of anything where there's a potential to be humiliated embarrassed or inadequate it it you know blows it all out of proportion to the actual threat i think a lot of i think a lot of people listening right now are completely identifying with these areas of humiliation embarrassment and inadequacy inadequacy because they you know i mean those are normal responses especially in an athletic environment and to kind of explore this a little bit more i'm going to start at the end of what a typical scientist or what a, what a typical athletic journey would be. And I, I actually think this is probably the, what you're going to say is the wrong place to start, but we're going to do it here. We're going to do it here anyway. Okay. And this is in competition, right? Because everybody wants to fix their psychology for a competition. That is typically the end goal of it all. And why I think it's the wrong way to start is because we typically think about it right before the competition in terms of how do I fortify my sports psychology in order to gain the extra last 
one percent of whatever but specific to what you were just mentioning in this in these areas of humiliation embarrassment and inadequacy those tend to be accentuated during the times of competition and they're especially so, accentuated especially, exactly especially especially and so what about competition actually does this and what happens on a on like a neurophysiology level to yeah. situate those qualities a, a lot lots of things in fact most of this happens in milliseconds before our sleepy frontal cortex smart brains have even had a chance to figure out wait what what what's happening but it's just a race <laughs> wait why am i needing to go to the toilet for the seventh time yes and why does my why yes. does my stomach the morning of a race saying why do i do this to myself this is there's nothing fun about this or why did bill talk me into this effing race i'm never doing this again or what psychologists call thoughts of escape you know those thoughts that you have in the first 20 minutes what am i doing here i've got no business being here get me out of here can i get a flat tire can i fake an injury you know all the some of the sabotaging thinking that that, that, that goes on or maybe i'm just being a bit too about me my own uh, <laughs> no there are a lot of people that are curling up in the corner i know right now i know they've done the exact same thing so but continue, we're all the same continue. so so here one really interesting lesson from the psychological research is that the as a goal as a human goal is to try and get rid of negativity or be as positive as possible without any negative gnawing away sort of demons or anxious is is not only futile because we've never met anyone who's able to do it right. and if they are they have say they've done it they're either lying or they're on psychotropic medication because they have a, the same ingredients as that i was born with and we know a little bit about the sort of neurochemical soup in our heads and how it responds to sit different situations. So I always find, you know, people who claim to not feel X or Y a little bit, you know, with a little bit of suspicion. <laughs> there are some people who who are like that. We can talk about those folks in a moment um, if you wish. But yeah, so but but I but I do think in its essence, one of the struggles is recognizing you haven't got to win the negative thinking fight the negative thinking mm -hmm. battle the really good athletes what they actually do is they learn to compete hand in hand with all the things that make them scared of being humiliated or will i look stupid embarrassment am i doing it right or obviously inadequacy am i good enough so those mm -hmm. three questions all athletes, regardless of whether you're winning an Olympic medal or you're doing a, an endurance run for the first time, you're human, you, you have a human brain, it's still equipped to react the same way, right? And you're not going to do this to, to reach this magical nirvana state where everything is positive. No, you're not. The good athletes <laughs> learn to jump ahead. So the metaphor I like to give this is often a me metaphor they use in psychotherapy. So imagine that you're standing on a, a, a hillside and you're watching a battle rage beneath you. Think of a sort of a really like brave hearty medieval type broadswords and blood and gore battle. And on one side is all of the parts of you in your head, thoughts and feelings of how you want to be or how you wished you were. And on the other is all the stuff like the real mess that it actually is your life right so all the things and you're watching this battle and we spend our lives buying another self-help book to sharpen that sword or give them a bigger bigger uh, shield or give them a bit more an advantage or wait till they're sleeping and then attack them or whatever the <laughs> you know the metaphor you like to use and and because that is so difficult to do, one of the reasons is that we don't have as much control over what we think and feel as we thought. Thoughts pop into your head. I can create thoughts in your head without you, even if you don't want them, I can give them to you and force you to think about them by just saying certain things. So we can't do that. So the good athletes, and this is actually the good stress managers in general, what we learn or we teach them is turning away from the battle skill. So in other words, instead of watching this battle rage beneath you, you're going to say, I'm, what I'm going to do is get you to look in the opposite direction. You can still hear the battle behind you. And that they'll be fighting for, a, for probably the rest of your life. They'll, they'll still be here when you come back, the same old gripes, the same old moaning. But wouldn't it be nice just for an hour 
that we can just leave all that behind us and be be somebody else or not have that for the moment or we kind of put it in a box and we drag it along with us but i've tried to muffle the sounds and the clack clang of swords as much as possible so all of the techniques that really seem to be much more effective this isn't just now for sport this is actually now uh, uh, showing to be the case in psychotherapy is the turning away from the battle versus trying to fight and win the battle right. seems to be critical. So this is the distinction between a what we call a control model of thinking, which is a lot of what cognitive behavior therapy is. I'm trying to think of all your the ways that we are irrational and replace negative with positive. And there, I'm not putting CBT and those just in that in that bit bucket but that's a lot of what we try and do a lot certainly the self-help world is that when really some of the more successful approaches one of them is called acceptance and commitment therapy is to saying we're all we've all got sort of a, a, a front of peanut galleries in our heads but you know what we just have to learn to be better at jumping hand in hand with it so come on, annoying racist grandmother who's at Thanksgiving, <laughs> a, me a metaphor for that, for that ugly thought that you just kind of like, we have to love her, we have to have her around, but God, I'm going to, you know, so this is the way that we actually start to be better. And then when you, when you talk to elite athletes, that typifies how they've been able to meet these goals. They've become better at becoming friends with the enemy versus trying to beat the enemy. So while all the mess is going on, they learn to work in concert with it. It's kind of what you're saying. That's exactly right. Or to learn how to, it's like the parent who's tuned out the toddler doing this every, you know, and if you, <laughs> if you don't have kids and you're around parents who have kids and they, I'm like, do you not see that the child wants your attention? And that the parent has been amazing skill at just being out. Oh, they've tuned them out. Right. So that's where we'd like to get to with our the thoughts that we have that say, you're not good enough. You're f too fat. You, you don't deserve a coach. Look at you. Everyone's quicker than you. Why don't you do something that you're actually good at? You've been a, all of the nonsense that our chimp brains try to tell us all well-meaning because what does it want us to do? It just wants us to not be humiliated, embarrassed or shown. To be so it's going to try every guilt trip in the book to get us to say, you know what, I could do it another day. I'll put it off until later. That's right. what it's trying to do. Okay. So you mentioned how the elite athletes that you work with, and we can also say maybe, maybe elite athletes in general have learned these skills, right? That's the yeah. end goal. And that's why I was saying earlier that we're probably starting at the wrong place, but I like the picture that it painted. <laughs> how do athletes get there? Because there's all of the there's all of these things out there, and some of them are cycle babble, and some of them are not. Of how you can become more compassionate, and you can disassociate from these feelings, and all of the meditative yeah. realms and things like that. There's there's a lot for athletes to kind of like weed through. They recognize that their head can be a shit show come race day. I mean, they they know it. They know it, but they don't know how to get to the place where they're good with the shit show happening yeah, and they can yeah. still perform. So what do you take athletes through? What do you have? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. And this is one of the big paradox uh, uh, paradoxes in psychology in general. We're trying to use the problem to fix the problem. Do you not see why that creates a sort of a weird <laughs> right, conflict right, of interest, right? right, right so right. this organ, this three pound lump that makes some of my life miserable on a Saturday morning, because in two hours, I know I've got to go out there and deliver on some capacity or something that I'm scared of. And yet at the same time, I'm trying to read how this thing that's causing me all this angst is also supposed to suddenly fix itself and magically make all that stuff go away. So the reason that most of the techniques that work, they're actually sleights of hand, metaphorically speaking. Mm. They're kind of like they're, they're tricks. They play, they leverage biology that we have based on the diff how different parts of our brain are actually functioning. So some parts of our brain work very, very quickly. Lightning speed, like our, our chimp brain is one of those, right? So within sort of uh, uh, 500 milliseconds, half a second, adrenaline is, or if we think or detect something that's, you know, I see Sally, you know, quick runner at the race. Oh my God, I didn't think Sally was going to be here. Oh my God. So now I'm just obviously racing right. for second again, you know, and all I've done is I've seen, I'm having a conversation with Jane and I see Sally out the corner of my eye and within, without me thinking Sally's here. So therefore I'm going to be this. Oh my God, I didn't, not, 
half a second adrenaline is already coursing through my veins and setting off there's a whole set of other reactions orchestrated by this thing called our hpa axis in our heads to set off hormones and neurotransmitters to get our nervous system on high alert or ready for the showdown with sally right and of course when our real brain catches up, our frontal, our, the real you, our professor brain, the wrinkly frontal cortex that says, oh, but Sally's a love, she's love, she's really sweet. You know, she trains hard as well, <laughs> right? Uh, chimp is saying, doesn't matter. She can show you to be not as good as everybody else. So you need to crush, um, um, annihilate Sally. At all. Well, hang on a minute, but I'm a nice person. This is the two brain fights, right? So... We get in these discussions, often they're at a subconscious level all the time. And so what we have to do, the first sort of guiding principle is, again, it's based on the assumption that might seem, it's easy to say, but it, but it might actually sound uh, um, controversial. Mind is the same as body. Your mind, what you think and feel, is a emergent property of your physiology, of your nervous system activity. So if your if your nervous system, your sympathetic nervous system, part of your autonomic nervous system that controls alertness and arousal and get ready for itness, cortisol and adrenaline, um, if that's going to change how you feel and think. Uh, so hormones and neurotransmitters can directly change and influence what you words appear in your head, thoughts. <laughs> And so ground zero is if I only try and say, I should not sorry, ground zero. If all, all, if all I try and get you to do is to talk you off a ledge, I'm strong, I'm confident, I'm beautiful, I know I can, I know I can, right? The, the mirror self-help mm -hmm. bullshit that doesn't work. The reason it doesn't work is because the, 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 the part of your brain that's been governed to give you those urges to get away, to leave, to why are you doing this, are, are far more, in fact, it's five times quicker and five times stronger mm -hmm. than the brain that is trying to say, yes, but, yes, but. It's a fight that you're never going to win. Right. So we have to try and, for any technique to work, we have to try and calm our body down. And that's easier said than done, right? So as most athletes now, it's become, it's, you know, if there was a year of, of mental training for athletes last year, it would have been the year of, of meditation, right? right. Or headspace. <laughs> right. or And so... And when, when we talk about meditation for athletes, one, you get the eye roll, like, oh, please, no, you're going to talk to me, oh, my God, really? I have to listen to Enya and join a drumming circle? Fuck that. <laughs> I, you know what I mean? Give me something, Doc, that I can, you know, it's just, for, for athletes, they're usually more action-oriented, they're like yeah, physical yeah, things, yeah. so right. just lying on right. the bed when I'm already anxious right. or nervous, which makes lying on the bed trying to concentrate even harder, it's really impossible. So, so for athletes, they're saying, do I have to have four years of tantric yoga training uh, if I want to get a handle on these demons that are telling me to not do it, be an ultra runner? No, you don't. And so what we do is we say, well, let's take some of the principles that meditation is teaching. And really, at the essence of it is called passive attention training. And passive attention training is simply, I use the metaphor of a firework display. Wouldn't it be great if our thoughts and feelings were like watching a firework display? As the big explosions in the air of think this, feel this, uh, but within seconds it's vaporized and before another mm. one has come up. Yeah. And I don't get a chance for the for that firework to say, aren't, aren't I amazing? My colors come with me <laughs> down the hole of negativity and I'll show you how shit you really are. Come on. I'm so right. So that's the way that most of us, our relationships with our thoughts and feelings are at the moment. They are suggestions that pop up in our head. For, for often for no reason whatsoever um, or someone has said something or I noticed something and we follow them voluntarily down a hole that makes us feel negative and miserable and all of the other self-doubt we have and so if I could only say I see you but not today or I see you and can we talk about this when we get back I've just got this 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 three-hour race to do and then we'll get into the what you're worried about so that's the relationship that we we kind of want to have have with it so we start with breath work and eye work the two portals to our nervous system that we can control i can control what i look at and mm. i can control 
the type of breath that I do. And breathing and eye, your, your eyesight and your breath are intimately connected neurologically to threat detection centers in the brain. So mm -hmm. ground zero is control. I mean, we've known this for some time, of course, you know, the Michael Phelps comes onto the deck. He did, you know, hoodie and headphones, control your mm -hmm. ears and your eyes. We, we've known that if I can stem the tide of sensory input that my brain is going to process five times quicker than my thinking rational brain. I need to run with blinkers on or with ear defenders so I don't get that reaction starts to cascade. But I can actually be a little bit even more proactive by not just running interference on stuff. I can actively calm those threat detection centers down. And there's some really now good research, some of which is coming out of a guy called Andrew Huberman. He's a neuroscientist at Stanford, has done some work on eye tracking and breath work that both quickly and rapidly impact autonomic nervous system, which changes our dopamine, serotonin, cortisol, adrenaline, this like constellation of our neurological soup that makes us feel good and makes us feel motivated. So you're basically saying that I'm going to go back maybe like 10 minutes. We can remember back that far from a neurochemical standpoint, we almost don't stand a chance. Don't because stand the, a chance because of the speed of the chemical reactions that happen. As you mentioned, 500 milliseconds, half a second, all these, you know, hormones and things are getting dumped. All these chemicals right. are dumped on our bodies. We don't have a chance to control that dump, but the mechanism to help, to, to help control what, how you react to that chemical sure. dump are behaviors that you're reinforcing and training somehow and you're and you're reinforcing the the eyes and the ears that is that's exactly right and so one of the things that we can do for example and some of the research is still new on this so one of the 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 pieces in our limbic system in our chimp brain is called the amygdala you might have heard mm -hmm. of the amygdala in fact we've got two of them so amygdala it's plural technically little almond shaped devices that work a little bit like satellite dishes on our heads that are scanning the skies for incoming threats to Jason, right? Or incoming <laughs> threats to Simon. This is uh, what Alex Honnold has none of. If that's what, okay, and, and, I'll, and, I'll, and I'll tell you, and we'll talk about why Alex doesn't. Um, and we love and why, you, Alex. We, go we do, we do. <laughs> so, so basically, this your amygdala, which is responsible for, think of your amygdala as having a sensitivity from like zero to 10, right? Zero is I have to literally punch my amygdala for it to say oh what's up boys are, is, are things are things gonna get bad what i didn't notice right these would be like mma fighters right uh, mma fight well yeah or th sensation seekers in general there you go okay uh, yeah. uh, uh, divers parachutists cliff yeah. jump you know whatever those people who have a right and their amygdalas are literally not literally metaphorically speaking encased in a wetsuit right they they don't feel Right. Uh, uh, the same way, the threshold for triggering that reaction. Now, take someone who's the exact opposite end of the spectrum. Most the tiniest puff of wind on their amygdala, metaphorical wind, of course, um, which is what really post-traumatic stress is. Post-traumatic stress is amygdala hypersensitivity syndrome, essentially. Mm. So your amygdala has been either through trauma or through genetics or through a combination of other uh, sort of exogenous insults, you know, <laughs> too many yeah. drugs and other yeah, kinds yeah. of stuff, yeah. um, uh, can either make this part of our brain really wet suited or very, very mm. sensitive. And we're all born. And even in fact, I will say, so for example, a really interesting fact is the level of circulating cortisol in your mother's um, uh, blood while in while you are in, ut in utero has an impact on the, the sensitivity of your amygdala that you're born with. So if your mm. mom during her pregnancy was under a tremendous amount of physical or emotional stress and there was a lot of circulating cortisol, your amygdala as a, as a fetus and then as, a, as a, um, an embryo, then a fetus and growing into a baby is actually you're going to be prime. You're going to come out of the womb like as though the world is about to attack you, right? right? Because you've, that's the environment yeah, that's that you've, environment. so there are, there are some environmental things, obviously how you're nurtured and how you've been, you know, grown up and so on. But we all, so for example, if you have high levels of what we call trait anxiety, so you kind of, you just, you just a bit more anxious than a, than your, you run hot generally, you just, things are a bit more anxious than a, than 
other people that you know of you think of your amygdala is probably a little bit more sensitive so how races or big training sessions feel to you how scary they feel are kind of probably be more exaggerated compared to the if if alex honold was actually a runner (laughs) uh you know he'd be like the probably on the start line look like the chillest dude you've ever met totally um (laughs) and they've just you know some people have uh you know uh, won the amygdala sensitivity lottery for some things <laughs> i will say not to speak to alex at all this isn't including him but people who have very uh, insensitive amygdalas are usually also at much higher risk for substance abuse and infidelity mm. and and that's partly because of it, it's a reflection is also about dopamine what i need to feel like alive or pleasure or anticipate excitement you know, you can't have it both ways. You can't have a dull amygdala. I don't feel fear, but I also need more to feel a rush. So those people are usually a little bit more in the sense. So, so don't marry a base jumper if you can. I was going to say, don't marry an endurance athlete. That's the same no, no, category no. of people you're talking about, right? Well, endurance athletes, <laughs> uh, endurance athletes seem to be a little bit different. They, they are certainly the research that we do have. Uh, they they do have a little bit more neuroticism and anxiety and no and they're kidding. not and the sport doesn't make them like that the sport attracts that right so we've at right. least we've we've kind of sorted out the the temporal pathway now of that yeah. but <laughs> but it's certainly to my knowledge they endurance sport endurance athletes aren't necessarily sensation seekers or because i because that would be inconsistent with being generally more anxious mm-hmm. but Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna back back to training again. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. We started at the end. We started the competition. You briefly touched on it. Some of the initial skills that you yep. work on with athletes are with vision and, and, and with sound or with breathing. Sorry, I don't know why you keep saying sound with vision with breathing. There's this notion in training, and I come from a like a classical physiology type of background. Yep. And so I think about training in terms of the amount of dose I need, the amount of yep. training dose in miles or intensity or some combination of those two to achieve some sort of physiological response. I need to lift 40 pounds because I lifted 30 yep. pounds last week, something like that. Athletes will oftentimes think of like building a, a psychological uh, skill set in that same way. I need to do something first. What's logical to do first? And then what's logical right. to do second? Is that even the way that we should be thinking about it, though? It, it is the, with a caveat. So the is part is that your brain responds to the principle of overload just like your body does. In fact, mm. that's a key principle of brain development generally. I have to stress, tax, and strain in order to grow denser, thicker, larger, right? That's the concept of neuroplasticity in the brain. I mean, there's other elements about how the, 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 the pathways or the network of neurons fire and so on. But in general, it does. Your brain responds very well to being strained and stressed. And in fact, if you don't do it deliberately, your brain will bludgeon you until you do do it. <laughs> and so you, you'll know this as being bored, for, for example. Right. So when you're bored, you're like, nothing seems to entertain you. Uh, you want something, you crave something, but you don't know quite what it is. This is really your brain saying, I need some stimulation. I need some overload. Uh, so your brain loves novelty. One of the, the, mm. the functions of our, one of the ways that we know that we can entice the brain to do things is give it a reward, but mess with the human about when they get the reward, mm, right? So right. we give them a reward yeah. like intermittently or we call a intermittent reinforcement schedule in psych terms. So they think like a, a slot machine, right? So the, the way that you can make the dopamine neurons in the human brain go absolutely loopy is ask them to pull a lever and there's a chance that they could come away with nothing, something or a lot, right? And you don't know what you're going to get when you pull that lever. Your brain is, that's like, you know, dopamine porn in your head, right? That sort of environment. <laughs> So this is why we're often, many of us are, are literally addicted to uncertainty when there's an outcome that could be really favorable. Mm. Um, now, uh, in, in sport, of course, what, particularly in endurance sport, we have often the opposite 
the, the, what they often say is the best athletes are those that can tolerate boredom the most, right? Mm, so now right. there might be no novelty, but I have to survive six of my, my easy long Sunday run and I have to be out there for five hours or six hours and I've, there's only so many podcasts or bloody things I can listen to. So your brain will struggle a lot more simply because that it doesn't really, it likes to stay occupied unless right. you can get... We talk about the computer brain, the one that runs our autopilots. So but you've heard of being in flow state or something, this, this sort of weird nebulous concept that you can be in this total immersion in a task that you lose all sense of mm -hmm. time and, and you just like, oh my God, where did it go? And I was just immersed in it. So there are, there are some circumstances where the, the, the stars align and you, even if you're doing something for a long time, it doesn't feel that way. But, but most of us in endurance sport, that isn't the case uh, because one of the things that stops us feeling getting in flow is having a noxious stimulus, right? So in other words, something hurts, right? It's hard to be in a flow state when you're in pain or a lot of discomfort. Right. Um, and so that's one of the challenges of doing finding that special place in, in, in endurance sport. But brass tacks, you want, if you want to start with vision and with breath, right? If you were to, I, I hate to do this because I hate people asking me this question. No, 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 These no. like universal questions that everybody should apply to. We know how individual and nuanced it is. And you can give all your caveats to this right, piece, right. Of, piece of advice now. But if you were just to say, listen, if everybody could just do these things yep. to start out with, we would be in great shape. Okay. I'll, I'll give you, I'll give you two or I'll give you three but you can the, give me the, 10 if you want to okay, give me ten. okay. <laughs> uh, so okay the first one which is actually about breath so um as you as uh your some of your listeners may know um you we all have a a, a huge band of muscle that is at the base of our thoracic cavity called the diaphragm it is muscle and we can voluntarily control it it's also under involuntary control that's why it keeps us it helps us expand our chest cavity when we're asleep. But we can also, I can deliberately change the tempo, the pace or the depth of my breathing, right? And that's, it's because of a nerve, a phrenic nerve, which is going from my be uh, base of my, um, uh, top of my neck to my diaphragm, like helping regulate how quickly it contracts and so on. Now, the good news, and this is the, where the mother nature hack part of the breath work comes in, is there's about 200 neurons that sit on your brainstem, top of your brainstem, that control uh, the what we call the SI response, the S I G H. You know, when we go like that, we've just done something that's really hard or difficult, and it's over. We're like, oh, thank God that's over. I've been now, doing that now that I've been recording my audio book. I did that. Like yeah, I know, today. I know. So that that's an innate mechanism that humans were born, animals were born with it as well. Um, uh, that activates two hundred around two hundred neurons to cut sends a message to our threat detection centers to calm down and to our diaphragm to, to, to lower the, the, the tempo and the depth of our breathing. So that's what happens physiologically. So we can reverse engineer that process as well. So if I can somehow manipulate my diaphragm, the, the phrenic nerve is also going to hopefully tell the 200 neurons, hey, we're good. We've, we've just done a, a, a we, we feel in that sigh state that something I feel relaxed and calm. Now something's over. So the physiologic sigh breath is a, a form of breathing that helps maximize that reaction to calm you down quite quickly. So Andrew Schuberman from the Stanford Lab talks about this quite extensively. And they've got a randomized controlled trial actually running about this particular breath compared to other breaths for lowering biomarkers of stress and also some mm. subjective stuff. And so what, what that looks like is it's two, a physiologic sigh breath to activate these 200 neurons is two stacked nasal inhales i know try saying that i mean what a ridiculous statement Stacked nasal inhales. so you're breathing through your nose yeah. one on top of the other right yeah. you're then holding that breath for the length of time that you did the two uh, nasal inhales and then you're breathing out through your mouth for double the length of the inhale so this is what it looks like if you are going to use show your video i can see you jason but your listeners might not no, be able to see me there's a youtube version yeah. okay so it sounds like this so 
So that's just one physiologic sigh breath. Now that works within seconds to calm threat detection centers down in your brain. I defy anyone to try it and not notice. They might not necessarily equate the feelings, the sensations they get after that breath with automatic calmness because we've become highly habituated to sensations that our brain gives us. And so I think that that means this when it doesn't. But in essence, that you are getting a physiologic, neurological relaxation response by doing that. Now, there's a law, there seems to be some law of diminishing returns on this. If you do it more than three times, you don't seem to get as much of a bet or you don't seem to get any additional benefit. So what we say to athletes and anybody who's going into environments that are pretty nerve wracking or stressful when you've got like a minute to go, you're standing stage left <laughs> or someone's doing the introduction before you go on and give your talk or it's just that, you know, you're waiting for your date to arrive or whatever it happens to be, stepping onto the, before the gun goes off. If you do that breath routine two to three times, you will, your, your a parasympathetic nervous system, your brake pedal for your, the part of your, for the activation alertness system is going to calm you down. And immediately, remember, it's hard to have an anxious thinking and feeling brain inside a relaxed body. So that just doing that alone, you'll start to feel better. And this is something we should be teaching elementary school children. Uh, to, instead of the use your words, Jimmy, we need to be saying, use your breath, Jimmy, right? Mm -hmm. Learn how, Jane. <laughs> Learn how to, before you calm down, because otherwise you're just speaking to a, an agitated chimp and, and obviously kids are all chimp. So they're just going to be screaming and, and whatever they want, urges, cravings, you're going to hear all of it. So having them calm down gives us a better chance of talking to someone in a sensible way. Anybody who's agitated, the last thing we want to do, well, the first thing we want to do is get them less agitated so that we can then talk to them. We're the same. Mm. So if we're going to do any sort of mantra or physical, like uh, a positive thinking, or I'm going to do this little routine that makes me feel good. If I'm doing it in a relaxed body, it's going to have a much better chance of working. So the breath, physiologic side breath is one. Another really- Wait, 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 before yeah, you go yeah, on, yeah. I'm, gonna let, I'm gonna let you continue, but I, 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 I would be remiss because my woo-woo bullshit detector went off just a little bit. And yeah, yeah, I'm, yeah. Sure, I'm sure you've heard this before. Yeah, yeah. What is physiologically significant about these two features of that exercise? The first one, nose versus mouth, because yep, yep. nose breathing is all the rage now, yep, as yep, you know. Yep. And the second one, the timing. What yep. are the physiological significances yeah, yeah. of those two? Of those two the, they're, they're great questions. I don't actually know if even the respiratory physiologists or the neuroscientists who study respiratory physiologists know the reason, right? So one of that we do know, though, for example, the different areas in our brain that control like generally the rhythmic part of our breathing that, you know, I know that an exhale has to follow an inhale, right? And there's a different part of our brain that regulates, I need to breathe in and then I need to breathe out and I need to do that over and over again. But there's another section of our brain, another part of our brain that controls uh, um, unrhythmic breathing, right? So why, do, why does our brain have to have a capacity to learn how to breathe un or out of sequence mm -hmm. or, or just like not have a straightforward in. It's because we talk as and we breathe at the same time. So if all we had was this sort of this uh, pre-bot complex, the part of our brain that regulates the rhythmic breathing, we wouldn't be able to talk. We'd be having to. Right. Uh, so there are there is a, there's probably something connected to the different oversight of the types of breath, and when we try and dysregulate it by, um, I was expecting a longer, uh, uh, you know, an exhale to come then, and it didn't. That could be one reason. The, the reason that the, some of the physiologists, uh, I should say, the neuroscientists give about the nasal inhales, and this may be, again, um, a stretch of the physiology, but the metaphor that's often used is that, so as you know, obviously, when, when you breathe, the little, the alveoli will inflate, uh, uh, and there's a surface tension to those alveoli. This is, and again, I'm, I'm not claiming this to be fact. I'm saying this is the defense of the sure. two stack nasal inhales. Yeah, yeah. So just as you would do blowing up a party balloon, a kid's balloon, and you blow into it, and that, it's really hard to get it, you know, you get it a little bit, and then you break that surface tension, and then it suddenly goes. <laughs> So the argument, and, and again, uh, 
the stretch receptors in alveoli membranes. I don't know whether they the, the, just like a balloon. I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so the anyway, so one of the one of the theories about it is that you actually get uh, the alveolus in. Uh, uh, um, you can inflate your, you get better gas exchange, bigger lung volume by doing a one inhale on top of the other. Whether that is a physiologic, there's a good biological pathway to support that, who knows? Yeah. But what I will say, and this is where it comes back to where I sit, which is function is key for athletes. Like, okay, what if I don't, if we don't necessarily, we want to understand mechanism. That's the obviously the holy grail because then we can start to manipulate control and predict and so on but if we don't we just know that listen are there any downsides to doing this are there any negative side effects we don't know okay you could do some you know there, there are some context of course where you're doing ra rapid hyperventilation breathing or breath yeah, holding right. and doing underwater whatever we know some of those but if you're an endurance athlete overland and you're trying to calm your nervous system down focusing on a pattern whether it's a box breath or a, a physiologic sigh or a wim hof or, well actually not wim hof because that'll probably do the opposite uh to calm or to activate our parasympathetic nervous system down we don't know what exact form that looks mm -hmm. like that's why one of the huberman lab what they're doing is they're testing the physiologic sigh breath compared to a box breath a standard four four mm -hmm. four four you know whole breath so who knows but i think it's an exciting time mm -hmm. uh it's interesting because every single week I get asked about all of these different breathing techniques and I kind of take the same approach you do is like, wow, we really don't know the physiological consequences yeah. of this breath versus that breath, but we can see some of the outcomes of them. We just don't know what's in the middle, right? We sure. know the action, we don't know the middle, but we know the outcome. So anyway, thank you for entertaining that. I know there are but people also that are listening out But there. Passing, <laughs> passing out of placebo as well is really, sure. is really difficult, yeah. right? And part of psychology, this is why psychologists get a little bit frustrated by placebo being seen, particularly among physiologists, as being the sort of thing you're trying right. to avoid. Right. Whereas right. psychologists will be saying, well, listen, uh, placebo is a demonstrate demonstrable effect that it has on a whole bunch. Now, of sure, mechanism is important, but we can also use that to our advantage. Right, hundred percent. Right. Okay, so you got the <laughs> breath. I, I cut you off. That was the first one. Second right. one. Second one is about coming out of visual neuroscience, which is uh, the rather awkward phrase called a self-generated optic flow, and it's based on the principle that at the back of our eyes. There's a, there's a layer, as an epithelial layer of cells, about three, uh, it's called the neural retina. It's about three, uh, like width of a credit card thick, uh, that really is brain tissue. So basically your eyes, are, is, is a fairly late stage evolutionary role for eyes to sense objects, right? Uh, what, what eyes were originally designed to do, if, if that's a phrase that isn't sort of set off lots of alarm bells for you know, the caveats to all this, but eyes really are about detecting or knowing how to put the body into an, a system of alertness or relaxation, right? Or to sense dark light cycles, right? All of our is synchronizing our, our body's clock to, um, to rhythms that go with light and dark. So, so our eyes play quite a key role in telling your brain and body whether I need to get ready to run, fight, hide, be chill, and so on. And, the, and there's a direct connection between the neural retina and some of these threat detection centers in our brain. And what, what the visual neuroscience community has found and is that when you are going to, when you get a level of uh, alertness or agitation, so this is all sympathetic nervous system, cortisol, adrenaline, other neurotransmitters and hormones start ramping up. Our attentional field narrows. They call it, we foveate. We get right. narrow and narrow. And that's just so for good reason, right? I'm paying attention. Right. I need to, this is important. And that's a normal reaction. When it goes off the deep end, we know it as, you know, uh, 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 paralysis and stage fright and, and, you know, fight or flight response, but it's a normal reaction that we want. Um, so, and our eyes tend to, and when we force our eyes to narrow, to foveate, it also starts this alertness response. So obviously when we are nervous or too stressed or we want to not feel uh, as anxious, our eyes play a critical role, what we look at. And so what happens is that when you are out in, in time and space in the real world outside and you're walking or just you're sort of moving through time and space naturally, 
the natural pattern for the human eye is to wander to scan the horizon. Now, it's, it's not as clean as left to right, left to right, because you're obviously looking up and down. But generally, our eyes are scanning our environment. And for good evolution, uh, uh, evolutionary reasons, right? Like now, we're not getting hit by a car, but then looking out for predators, peripheral vision, and so on. But there's a state that our brain seems to ha have a lower level of, when I say agitation, so all the indicators of that alert response seem to just level off or reduce when we switch, when we go from sort of a portrait mode to landscape mode of vision. And so this principle is behind as a, as a whole um, uh, uh, a technique now for helping people uh, overcome trauma, uh, mm -hmm. like PTSD, it's called EMDR therapy, yep. eye movement desensitization reprocessing. And it's basically capitalizing on, in, in, in a nutshell, the fact that if I can purposefully train my eyes uh, to scan horizons, I mean, the, again, there's, there's there's, the, there's, there's a, the, the small print about how it works and why it works is a lot more complicated than that. But in essence, that's what I'm doing. So for athletes, what we say is that why does make going for a run make us feel better? Or why does doing any exercise feel better? Well, there's some reasons we know now, like brain uh, body temperature uh, and brain temperature and all these other reasons why exercise generally affects our mood. But one of the newer interesting is this mechanism between our neural retina and our threat detection centers is that we, we because when we're inside and feeling stressed, we're probably a bit have a vision or a focus like this. And when we go outside or forced to, we switch to panoramic and that activates a set of neural circuits that help our brain calm down. So this is uh, the, where, the, the, where this, the rubber hits the road for this uh, is to say, okay, I've got something that I'm nervous about or I'm stressed about, and it might seem the simplest piece of advice to just, you know, why don't you just go off and walk for five minutes or something mm -hmm. or just, yes, that works. But while you're doing that, don't take your phone with you or try not to just, you know, be looking down at your feet. What I would like you to do is I'd like to walk and just pay attention on, on actually looking at your surroundings, right? Mm. And so that seems to, and again, some of this research, some of the experimental evidence is still fairly new. We've got evidence now in mice uh, that their threat detection sensors, their visual system, that calms them down. So there's a good reason to suggest that that may be the case in humans as well. So controlling your eyes is a, is a critical piece and not just blinkering yourself, but making sure that you've got some good horizon scanning sort of uh, emotions in your prep. These seem so simple. Yeah. And that's what people are going to think right now. They're like, okay, you're telling me that this specific breath technique, you're going to have to remind me on the vocabulary, the yeah, yeah, double yeah. stacked breath. What is it yeah, again? Yeah. It's, uh, it's called a physiologic sigh breath. Physiologic, physiologic, no, the, no, the, the two inhales. Oh, two stacked the, nasal inhales. Yeah, so just breathing nasal, twice through your nose. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Two stacked nasal inhales. And scanning the horizon yeah. are two of the fundamental things that people should start with. Well, I, the reason I say that is because these aren't hacks. The, ha the word hack, mm. it may be for you as well, makes my hair stand on the back of my... I don't like I'm the phrase. The, uh, by, <laughs> so these are inbuilt mother nature, whatever you want to call it. They're mechanisms that the human brain and body already has to help us manage stress, right? Mm. We just don't use them often volitionally we we actually you know we could do but we don't nearly as much as we could to help us re react or respond to stress or cope with stress a bit more and so it's, it certainly doesn't uh, it's not the be all and end all uh but if you want the if you want the, a good soil to work in to grow your seeds of being mm -hmm. calm and confident you gotta focus start you gotta start focusing on relaxing the body enough so this stuff st the other stuff sticks well, it's almost like you're taking an evolutionary biology perspective first. Let's work on those things first, and then we can work on all the other things. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. That's so interesting. Okay. So now we're going to go back to the beginning, which was the end. If people are keeping track, I'm losing track now too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. This is something that is really specific to endurance events and more specific to ultra endurance events. There's a lot of space. Mm-hmm. Right, a lot of space, and you mentioned earlier a couple of things. Is one that the best endurance athletes are the best ones that are being bored. They can deal with that space. They can deal with all that time. They can just handle it better. 
but there's a lot of there's a lot of space and i used to say doubt but i'm not and now i'm going to use some words that, that came <laughs> up earlier in the conversation there's a lot of space for humiliation embarrassment and inadequacy <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> or the per, or perceived of any right. of those three for athletes to kind of go through throughout the course of a race and i see this all the time in ultra marathons where an athlete comes into mile 60, mile 70, mile 80 of a hundred mile run. Yeah. And physically they're, they're pretty beat up by that time. I mean, they've run 60 or 70 yeah. miles. Like that's, that takes yeah. a physical toll, but they're not nearly on the level where they should be dropping out. Yeah. Somehow they're erroneously extrapolating how they feel right then to how they are going to feel in another 20 miles and say, no, I just can't do it. I can't do it. It's not like I've, I, I've been internalizing this, right, for all this time. I'm going to be, you know, that much more humiliated, embarrassed, or feel that much more inadequate <laughs> between mile 80 and mile 100. Yeah, and, yeah. They, and they kind of choose to quit. And it is the quintessential mental DNF. Yeah. And it happens all of the time. What, like, what is out there to prevent that from happening? Because I have to resort to physicality where I kick yeah. people out of the aid stations in order to battle it. So I'm looking for like a selfish reason to serve yeah. tools. I that know I that's a use. great, uh, that's a great example. Um, so there's a couple things. For, firstly, just about what's happening and then what to do about it. Right. So obviously, when you're left alone for long periods of time, most of our thoughts, because we're, we've been endowed with a very powerful prefrontal cortex, and, and we have one of the few species that can time travel in our own heads, right? We can think about situations that are in the future, have never happened, or in the past. Um, and so when we don't have competing, we don't have a lot of, we don't have a busy environment to distract us or to pull us out of that. We tend to retreat, especially if... And we, we, in our book, we talk about having a default sort of attention, what we call an attentional style. Think, like, think of it like you got four TV channels, only four, CNN, Fox News, whatever. Think of four channels. And you, we all have the one that we is our happy channel, the place that we like to be in. And that, and that use, they, they vary on a function of internal, external. So some people like to be in their own heads. Some people are outside their own heads. And then broad and narrow. So you, that creates a four little quadrants so if i i'm a broad internal my channel is what we call broad internal so i when i get stressed or nervous i go in my own head and i strategize i problem solve i you know try and i, I don't get focused on one specific thing the broad now, part that i get focused on the broad part right yeah, so yeah. i'm all over the place which is a good skill to have but under pressure or stress that right. becomes your mm. undoing now someone who is a narrow external person sorry to use these confusing phrases here so now when they get stressed they go outside of their own head and they see and they focus in on a one particular detail right this is the kind of the deer in the headlights mm -hmm. uh, but it's the also we know the channel that is most conducive to doing well in elite sport right especially Especially if you have to react to things so this is more applicable to ball sport athletes than mm. than sort of just monotonic you know sort of uh, monotonic you know monotonous uh, 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 um, closed motor pattern um, so anyway we get we, we start so it's no we, the perfect storm to worry and think is like an endure is an ultra right that's this is like if you couldn't create a better <laughs> set of circumstances <laughs> And then you add in some level of predisposition to worry or anxious, like anxiety or neuroticism. And it's the perfect storm for getting sucked away on this like downward spiral of negative thought. And in fact, we now know what's happening in the brain, why that happens and what things are actually can help like... Um, uh, like counter that tendency to get lost or caught up in the the red firework that's telling pick mm -hmm. me to go and think why your life is pointless right or whatever it happens to be or why this is a stupid thing that you've chosen rather than just let it fade in the next one so that becomes managing that process like what i'm focusing on in the moment as a function of time becomes really critical um and again it's it's no it's no uh um uh, no coincidence that the, the the place the last place you need to be is inside your own head. So what we say is, 
we need to get you out of your own head as much as possible. So you give yourself little mental gains or targets or things that you can do when you're running. And we typically do this like mile, you know, or time from our four to five. This is your little mental game that you play, mm. right? It might be an eye target game. And so you pick out of things in that are 300, 200 to 400 yards in the distance and you run towards them. And as you're running towards them, you're counting things that you're getting more acuity of. It's a tree. And now I can, now I can some close enough to see there are that actually five branches and the leaves are some so you're like you're trying to figure out what you're but you're running towards something and then you do that again that is a simple technique to get me out of my own head right because there's i'm having to pay attention to something it's like when you this is why running doing anything in the presence of other people you do you perform better and this is a, one of them the most robust psychological findings it's called the social facilitation effect it was first demonstrated in the 1800s by a guy who studied cyclists, actually, a guy called Norman Triplett. Uh, but it's since been replicated that in the presence of someone else doing the same thing, you will do better, right? So now you're saying, well, hang on a minute. Mm. Okay, in cycling, I, I can draft, of course. But what about side by side? And I have to wind a fishing reel in. And who can wind in the most line in, in 30 seconds? I wind in more line if I'm doing it with somebody else. So the brain, the human brain is wired to be faster, more efficient, more gutsy, more persistent when you are in the presence of So This is the nature of competition, right? So spending a lot of time on your own with nobody else around, with an anxious disposition, it's the perfect effing storm to get lost into the, the lone sock in the dryer, which is your nagging thought that you can't get rid of, right? So find things to occupy yourself with. If there is someone who's running a similar pace, have a conversation, even if it's just for a minute or two talk to a marshal or someone on the course who's helping any chance you can get to pull yourself out your own head if you are a an over cogitator and warrior that will be very helpful one of the things that i give my athletes to do and it's all of those examples are perfect ones and i've heard a lot of sports sure. psychologists they yeah. come up with their own little games yeah. but the one anchor point that i think is extreme that is extremely important with these is to to pick a moment in time or a moment during the race that you're going to do it. Don't let the athlete choose where to do it. You're going to say, listen, you're going to do this at mile 70. And yep. you might be guessing when they actually need to go through yep. that exercise. But what just what I found in practice, and you can, you know, you can mm -hmm. espouse on this however you want to, is that they're left to their own devices. The sock in the in the in the in the dryer, <laughs> as you mentioned, will just keep going and it'll ne and it'll never and it'll never stop. Yeah, they might need it at mile sixty five versus mile seventy five, and you said it was really seventy or whatever yeah. it is, yeah. and you're off by whatever. Great, but the fact is, is they did it, and you gave them a deliberate point to do whatever activity to get out of their own head. Yeah, that's, you're you're exactly right. So rumination or having the tendency to get stuck on particular patterns of thinking is also one of the good predictors of depression and other mental health issues. So it's a good reason to try and avoid getting stuck into that process generally. Mm -hmm. um, but any chance that you get to run some interference on that process is going to is going to help, right? So any any and again, there's no there's no. Uh, um, special uh, book about you know what the thing is there's nothing right. special about you know thumb tapping or talking <laughs> or fucking counting leaves or stop signs or whatever it doesn't matter but it's just really running interference on effort perception and our sense of time uh, and that's going to help everybody out there that is going to pace somebody this summer for a race is now like you know, in their little conniving minds coming up with the most absurd, ridiculous games to play with their runner when they get there. I'm, I'm pacing some people for some 200 mile races this summer. And now that's, this has got my, well, it's, uh, it's funny because one of the, one of the things that we do with ultra runners, especially, or actually, uh, or, um, Ironman or, or people who do more than one Ironman at once, you know, um, they, one of the things is with your crew or your support crew, if you're lucky to have support crew is that you talk through the kinds of feedback you want when, right? So you're pre-planning mm, right, the things. Right. And so I need you so to huge. be, I need you to be a drill sergeant here. So when I, 
I'm moaning that I've had enough. I need you to say, get the back out there. You've, you've got, and I also know that when I'm going to hurt myself because I'm in a bad way and I want to get back out there, you are able to step in and how to do it. So you have to have that conversation ahead of time. And the reason, to go back to your point, why you should never let your brain figure out what to do when it wants is because you're using the problem to try and fix the problem. Right, the thing that's right. giving you the most angst now is the last thing that you want to rely on to tell you would now be a good time to change, right? Yeah. So having a little bit more of a plan. So we'll have for our particularly for athletes who are doing events that last at least four hours, we'll, we'll have a, 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 a piece of paper with their psychological game plan. Yeah. It's like by either time or distance, this is what you're going to be focusing on for this segment, then this, then this, then this. Yeah, and as you know, that's usually the last or the least considered point. Usually people are focused on their splits, yeah. How fast am I running? How, you know, what's my bike split going to be in yeah, triathlon yeah, yeah. and things yeah, like that? Yeah, They're yeah. focused on their nutrition. I'm going to take a gel at minute 43 yeah, and then yeah. two blocks at minute, you know, 57. And they yeah. get down to that little level of that like level of precision that is, you know, not at all material, but then they leave off all of these other cues from their race plan that they should actually have. And I look at those things. I'm like, there's a big chunk of this missing. In fact, all of this stuff, like the order of priority that you just put all this stuff on, yeah, yeah. it needs to be reversed. Yeah. Like you're going to fit, if you don't have your nutrition program figured out by now, you shouldn't have to write it down on, on a piece of paper. You should have it dialed. Like you should be right. telling your crew, this is how I want you to react in these types of situations. Yeah, absolutely. No, I, I agree wholeheartedly. And that's also just consistent with having a good sort of process focus, right? Yeah. That all the things that yeah. are going to sort of help. Um, yeah, but it, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a challenge. Uh, but I, the thing is that amazes me the most with athletes is how, and coaches, how much of their sport that they still attribute, not still, that they attribute to the role of what you think and feel yet, how little effort they devote to getting better at it. And again, there's nothing, you know, if you think of your head, just like you would a muscle, you have to, you know, principle of overload and specificity. I and mean, it's still the kind of similar process to getting better at it. This is why the, the adage is that you cannot learn mental toughness. You have to earn it. That's the nice. no amount of reading that you can intellectualize what you could do, but you get better at it by doing it. That's the overload. It's like trying to think your way to fitness, right? You can't do it. <laughs> <laughs> I um, love the analogy think your way to fitness i'm going to use that <laughs> uh you you can't do it so how many times are you doing a training session in a month where you look at it and say i can't do this who i don't know who the, this my coach thinks i am i can't do this like it's it's scary right i'm not talking about this is going to hurt but i definitely know i can do it i'm talking about i don't think i can even finish this what are you talking about so we like to put athletes in that situation at least mm -hmm. once every two weeks, because what we're doing is the way that the human brain eventually draws a new line in the sand of what's possible. And we know, for example, again, one of the most robust findings in psychology is the biggest driver of confidence is success. Right. If I've done something and I pulled it off, that's the, the most potent. It blows everything else out of the water for what makes you more confident. So I, if I'm having, I've got an athlete who is self-belief issue or they're not that confident, I'm looking to give them quick wins on feeling successful in every single session. So you have to use these, these tools like, and here's a session that is designed for you to not have be successful. In right. fact, it's designed for you to fail, but you know that that's the goal. So then you go in with thinking you become less obsessed with pacing or, you know, the zone I'm in, and it's about persistence, I stuck it out, I committed to do a third of it, and I got to the third, and I thought, no, I'll do a more, I do more than I thought I could, I'll go to a half, and then I'll turn around. Are you doing things to get yourself out of your comfort zone? And that's the way that you learn to improve your ability at it. You just have to do it more often. Oh, I love that, man. I love that uh, philosophy of designing things that you know cannot be achieved and but you start out with the goal saying listen this is designed for failure and it's by funny but, but we failing, do this or yeah, by failing you're gonna actually succeed right well it's funny because we do you know anybody who spent any time in the gym knows that occasionally we'll do reps to failure 
it's a it's a part and we don't think of it like oh my god if i can't do this one people are going to think i'm a why don't we use that in our endurance training sometimes we do but we should be doing that far far more often uh so yeah there's a whole other there's a guy called sam mccora um if you haven't heard of him he's a researcher in effort perception alex hutchinson in Mm -hmm. his endure book quotes him a lot he's at university of bologna Mm -hmm. now just some fantastic new exciting research on that's still somewhat contentious admittedly but about how the brain processes effort related cues or discomfort and all of the inputs that go into that little algorithm that before it spits out into our own heads as a perceived exertion rating. There's a whole other set Uh, of things that go in, like how long do I have to put up with this for, right? right? That calculation happening in milliseconds of your brain is doing without you even being aware of it. If you deny your brain that piece of information, most people's brains shit the bed. How yeah. long, what are we doing today for the run? Oh, just follow me. How long are we going to be out? Oh, well, I don't know. Could be 30 minutes, could be three hours. Oh my God. Like what? No, system malfunction, right? I need to know where we, so so the, this this sort of information is really important. So we can use that to our advantage. We can do deceit pacing studies and we can manipulate or deliberately give athletes sessions where they don't know how long they're going to be right. out there for. Yeah. All good uh, um uh, efforts to to develop uh, um, your ability to tolerate discomfort in the future. Those though that research, I've just been digging into that last like nine months or so, where they <laughs> they've blinded athletes to a component of what they're doing, whether it's speed or power or yeah. you know whatever, or they blind them to the end point, or they falsify the information. Those sto- those studies are they're like hilarious to read and also kind of sad because you know like how bad the people feel that are actually doing the trials. They're like, God, I know I'm doing 300 watts or I know I'm doing six minute pace. And it says I'm only doing six minutes and 30 seconds a mile or something like that. It's just yeah, so yeah, torturous yeah. to read. Or how <laughs> angry you get if, you, if, you are, if you're asked to do, you know, eight 400s and then somewhere you finish them and you, everything, the last one you want to finish on a high note. They say, oh no, we actually need no, two no, more. No. Yeah, two more. And, I, and you just, you want to like <laughs> punch somebody, right? <laughs> or or in cycling it might be the same in running as well oh you got someone on the side of the road you're almost there it's the the hill the, the summit is just around the corner <laughs> and the summit could be 50 yards from where they said you want to go back and like murder that person right because you're so mad because the brain is like freaking out <laughs> so good all right Simon, we're gonna leave it there man that was great this is a great conversation uh before we let you go though where can people find you and more about your coaching and the book yeah, so they can find us on. Uh, I coach with my wife Leslie Patterson. So they on our co- on our website, which is braveheartcoach.com, braveheartcoach.com, uh, and there is information about our coaching and also our book on there. And we've also got something on there we call a smog test, which is a, just a little uh, people can fill out to tell us about their training, and we have a free no strings chat with them about you know training they're doing and tips to how to improve it. Uh, so we love talking to athletes. It's information for us to help us build our data bank of things that we've heard or things that might work. Or so we're always looking for that. I appreciate you coming on. This was honestly one of my favorite conversations, not only because it's an interesting topic, but also we got to use the word shag and a few <laughs> four letter words mixed in there. So I always, Oh, I know. It. I apologize. It could have okay. been worse. It could have been Leslie. My, my listeners are used to it by now okay. and I always get the caveat at the beginning. So it's all good, man. Appreciate your time. My pleasure. Thanks for having me on Jason. All right, folks, there you go. Much thanks to Simon for coming on the podcast today. Really appreciate that conversation. I really did have a lot of fun with that. That was pretty hilarious. I hope you, the listeners enjoyed it. If you did enjoy it, go ahead and give this podcast a rating or review on Apple podcast. That really helps me out a lot. You can check out Simon and Leslie's coaching on the links in the show notes. Notes. They're all there. Appreciate the heck out of each and every one of the listeners. And as always, we will see all of you out on the trails.